Thank you for that introduction. Hello and welcome. It's been a while since I've been in front of a crowd of three people. So this is great. Uh, and hello to you at home or in your office or wherever you're seeing me from. Uh, my name is Ash. As I said, I'm a user experience designer and researcher, just an overall consultant. And I've been in this area for a little over a decade now. Some of you might be asking, what's UX? So before I get into my talk, I like to say, what the heck is a UXer? Well, it's someone who is trying to make tech make sense. I want to work your process seamlessly so it just, uh, your technology just kind of melts back into your process and help you meet your goals with as little pain as possible. So I do this through user research, watching people actually use our products, process design, making sure that the actual process that you're taking to, to get from point A to point B is efficient and effective. I do interaction design, which is what's on screen and how people use those elements, as well as interface design, which what those elements look like. And then I do usability testing to make sure what we put out there works and we refine from there and kind of go through that process. So in short, I love helping people. I love people um, having that wow moment that the technology isn't fighting them, that they're make, I'm making a huge dent, taking away pain, solving root problems, and not just symptoms. So when I first joined my first UX job out of school, I was expecting for big process-oriented projects going out into the field, meeting with users, solving real problems, working all over the country because I, I started working for a nationwide country company and I thought this was going to be great. And I showed up to work the first day and they didn't have a desk for me and they didn't have a computer for me. And I asked why and they said, well, we don't have a desk for you because we just have a new intern in your cube and he showed up at work a week before you, but don't worry, you'll get your desk in August. Said, okay, so does he have my computer too? No, we just need to get it through the process that you're ordering, we just haven't gotten it yet. So I spent the first week of my brand new job reading through technical documentation because I had nothing else to do. And then finally, I did get a desk that was a little bit more robust than this and a computer. And I got to see my first project. And I was very excited to see what I might be working on, what, what super technological advancements I might be working on. And huh, this is known as a green screen, as we call it. And you might be thinking, oh, Ash, did you start your job in the 1980s? And the answer is no, that's, that's when I was born. No, I actually started my company at my company in 2011. And my job for the first year was to convert screens from the green screen to the web. And it was pretty soul sucking to be honest with you because I didn't get to do any research with end users. I didn't really get to talk to anybody. I got to talk to my business analyst and a few subject matter experts. And essentially it was just turn these things into screens as fast as you can. So I made balsamic mockups uh, where I sketched out what I wanted them to look like. And then I put them in these really intensive design document specifications where I had the screens and I, and I took notes on each screen. And then I would go through and say, you know, you're supposed to use a text field here and a drop down here and here's all your inputs and blah, 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 blah. You can see I had to use this pretty ugly design schema. And then it would get released and it would look kind of like this. And it wasn't exactly what I had coded. And a lot of times it wasn't even this close. And I became, began to get really frustrated. And I kept telling the developers, this, this isn't what I gave you. And they said, this is exactly it. This is exactly the same. And so I, actually went to the code myself and I started hacking around and I showed them what it should look like. Now, this doesn't really look like that big of a difference to you, right? I mean, it's just a little bit of spacing. I don't know, this screen is really not that big of a deal, right? Everything's pretty much laid out where it's supposed to be. 
there's some padding issues, there's some alignment issues, there's a bunch of different stuff, but it's, it's not that big of a deal. But I made it work. And I told my developers, now my code is super hacky. Now, if you looked under the hood, this is probably what it would look like, right? Just everything's just duct taped together. And I said, in my comments, in my code, do not use my code. In my emails to them, do not use my code. But they did anyway. So now I'm working from 8 a.m. to midnight to code this stuff up, this stuff up. Because remember, I'm not a developer. This is not my strong suit. So I have to power through this stuff. I'm miserable. The designs look good-ish on the front end, but I'm adding to the inefficiency of the load times and the screen because they started using my hacky code. And I didn't really know what to do. And to me, you might have looked at those screens and say, well, that's not a big deal, but this is what it looked like to me. So go ahead and type in the chat. What do you, what do you think this image is? What does this image look like? Any guesses? You can shout out from the audience. Beer pong? Beer pong? A desk, sleep paralysis, strange stop sign. Yeah, so this is the intended design, ping pong. And you can see these two are not the same, right? So this is what it looks like to a designer when you kind of mess up the code. Um, and it might not make a lot of sense to some folks because they, they look very similar. And now when you see what I was getting to, you're like, oh, okay, yeah, that, that kind of looks right the initial user is not going to see the intended design. The initial user is only going to see your end product. All right, so I switched project teams after the end of that, and this, proj this problem just kept wrapping up in different forms over and over and over. And I realized it wasn't just one developer or one development team, it was the entire culture of that development department. And one of the reasons that was, is because CSS is difficult. So there must be a better way. So we had a component library and how component libraries are supposed to work is you basically have a bunch of Lego bricks that you can snap together and reuse these, all these components in different ways. And that's a lot easier than custom printing each of your components. So when you look at this, which is easier to use, share, and maintain? Well, it's generally the Lego bricks, right? It's not making every single custom component and then figuring out how you can wedge your next 3D printed piece with someone else's. Unfortunately, with our component library, we weren't exactly following the best standards. So component libraries, as I said, they standardize your common components, you bake in your theme, so you don't have to worry about fonts, textiles, color schemes, padding, behaviors, animation. It makes it easier for developers to switch teams and to swarm into your team when needed. And it eliminates a lot of the same wasted effort of climbing up the same hill over and over and over again, because not everybody is coding up the exact same things in slightly different ways. But you might say, don't we already have that? And you saw that pretty ugly library. And yeah, but ours has issues and it's freaking ugly. So the UX team, we realized there was a problem. The component team, a whole two people, also realized it was a problem. But what do we do with it? So we kind of laid out what our problems were. Well, one, we had the full stack developer myth. And many of you are probably still entranced in this full stack myth. And some of you are saying, hey, I'm a full stack developer. You, you stop talking, lady. Um, well, yes, there, you can do both. But most of the time, developers cannot do everything equally well, and you can't stay caught up on the latest trends of everything, back end and front end. So generally, you have something that you do really well, and then something that you do because you have to. So we were having that where people that were really proficient on the back end and really enjoyed back end coding were being forced to do front end coding because developers can do everything. And this developers can do everything approach took out QA as well. We just started getting rid of quality assurance specialists because developers can do everything. We also had an ugly component library. So a lot of our teams were like, we really don't want to use this. We want our stuff to look good. And this doesn't look good. Our components were inflexible. We had to move. Uh, it was hard to move 
to new technologies as we evolved, because remember, we had two people supporting our component team. There was poor support for components because, once again, two people, so we have to prioritize. There's poor design guides for components because UX, we we're in charge of the design guides, but we weren't given money or time to work on it. So it was just whenever you can. We had lack of training for developers. The UX just wasn't important. The component library wasn't as important. We, we taught them other things. And we had a lack of infrastructure for sharing. It was pretty much just go grab a, something from a Google search. So there are a lot of better ways to do this. And after a lot of wrangling, we came up with some solutions. One, we needed UX to stop being coders because I did not want to keep working from 8 a.m. to midnight. It was unsustainable for me. So, and everyone else. We decided to combine the component team with the UX team. So that really kind of married those two teams together so that we could essentially have the UX team have a development arm. And with the, that really close relationship, we made a better component library. And we had a really brilliant uh, developer named Carrie Smith who made a uh, flexible framework independent library. So his goal was we want it to move with technology. So it's framework independent. It can lay on top of anything. And I still don't know how it works, but I think it's great. Thanks, Carrie. Finally, we made a move toward Material. So Material is a Google design library. And we decided that if we don't have the funds to support our own design library, we're going to use somebody else's. And we were only going to maintain exceptions to Material in our guidelines. So we had this fully robust website for material that people could go to it was maintained outside of ourselves. And we're just going to keep exceptions in house. And finally, we added a storybook library for devs to share custom components when our component library just couldn't keep up. So just kind of to talk about the differences between these. Elements is our component library, and it was created by a development center of excellence. And it took us a lot of work to do it because they, they decided that we were right. They needed to change the size of the component team. So they changed it to a component team of one, which was not exactly our advice, but we, we had to work through it. Uh, but we had a quality assured common use cases. It was robust. It avoids security vulnerabilities. It was maintained and supported. And we had unfortunately a longer development life cycle for new components because one we had one person and two we wanted to make sure it was done quality was done right it was done for all use cases not just for one and then we have storybook which supplements this so this is kind of our workaround if we can't control how many people we can have on the components team we can at least have some developers helping themselves try to allay that tragedy of the commons so the storybook the quality varies, but they have specialized usage that other people might find helpful. It's got variable flexibility. Some are really robust, some are not. It really depends on who makes it. Variable security vulnerability. Obviously, we test everything we can, but in certain cases, certain code may not be as, as secure. And it has the not my job support. So developers do support it, but it's not their critical path. It's not their job. So sometimes it falls by the wayside, but it's a quicker development life cycle and it's a really great idea for people to share those new components. And a lot of those new components somehow wind up in elements after our team of one, Carrie, uh, finagles them and makes them a little bit more robust. And then we went to material and I'm not gonna bore you with this, but basically we did material because it was robust, it was highly adopted and it looked a lot better than, do you remember that old screen? A lot better than that. And it had this understandable paper lack philosophy. Things sat on top of each other. But I will tell you, sometimes with material, sometimes I hate it. Just get a little introspective with you. Google material is great for simple use cases and mobile designs. It falls apart a lot on desktop. And it doesn't handle highly complicated and data dense design scenarios very well. So we're doing a lot of specialization there. Not everything in life is easy as ordering takeout. And as much as I'd like it to be, striving for simplicity is great, but sometimes things have to and are more complex. So 
Google material definitely has us doing a lot of extensions. But for the most part, problem solved, right? <sighs> so let's look at another example of how my life looks now. So it's no longer this, right? We got rid of this. Now we've got your standardized component library. Got your post, your stop sign, your head, towards your shoulders, everything's laid out. So they should be able to put it together beautifully. Damn it. So we're getting closer, right? We're getting closer, but one thing I still learned is CSS is still difficult. And sometimes developers still can't spot the difference. It just, yep, looks the same to me. It's just a puzzle to them. So we started doing better practices where I was using Azure RP prototypes so that they looked pixel perfect. And then we got this style guide and design theme. And there's a hundred pages of documentation of all the different possible ways that you could possibly add things to the screen and what it would look like. And it turns out developers don't want to read a hundred pages of documentation. So then uh, our very brilliant graphic designer and user experience specialist, Melissa Wallowitz, made this visual design quick sheet. And she intended this not just for our UX audience, but for our um, developers where we have these little colored squares and they represent different pixels. So a yellow square is a 32, a red square is 24, blue is 16, et cetera, et cetera. And so that way developers could clearly see how much room was in between. And this changed my development life. This completely changed my relationships with the developers because they could actually see what I was talking about. And I noticed almost immediately that they were adjusting and changing. They just needed more guidelines. It was the, oh, now I see it. Why didn't she just say so? Why didn't she just point it out? There was still some pushback, but do they want to see it? And some didn't. And the reason why they didn't want to see it is because some people didn't like the design. Also, whenever you get in these big projects, there are oftentimes missing requirements or there are gaps, things that the project team didn't think about until they were starting development and then realizing, oh, we have no idea how this is supposed to work. And oftentimes that's when you'd bring me back in and we'd talk, have a conversation, but sometimes they just put it together. The constant tweaks and also usability test adjustments. So usability tests, we actually put a real user in front of the code and we have them work on it as if I wasn't here, as if no one was watching them and see what they do. And based on what they fall down on and what they stand up on, that's where we start making adjustments to make it more intuitive, user-friendly, the process to match. And so with these problems, especially that I don't like the design problem, that was another hill I had to climb. So I needed to do even better practices. I needed to develop a better relationship with my developers. So I started opening up 15 minute every other day touch bases. So every morning for 15 minutes outside of Scrum, we would talk about the design, what they were gonna do today, if they had any questions. And then I had an open chat channel available so that people could just ping me at any point and I'd be available. I also started including not just my business analysts and my SMEs, but also my developers. It seems silly, like why wouldn't you include your developers? But I included my developers in my brainstorming sessions. And a lot of times developers that I'd been with in the past had basically said, we don't wanna be in meetings. We don't wanna be part of this, like do it on your own. But including them in those brainstorming meetings brought out their ideas. And when I started sharing my research findings and sharing sessions with them, like, here's what I went out to the field to do, here's what I learned, that started bringing more ideas. So they started liking the designs more and they started buying into the design more. Then I started bringing my developers with me in the field. And it became even easier with COVID because I was bringing them with me digitally. So they all they had to do was just to log on. And that let them really feel that empathy for the user because they got to feel the pain and see what was happening. And we started doing design reviews. The entire team would be able to critique the design and I could go back and fix it separately, but everybody got to, to air out their grievances. And I started making my QA tech lead, my PM, my devs. And I say QA because that's kind of aspirational. I generally don't have one. 
uh, they started making them allies. And we even started uh, with my lead, Megan McRae, we even started a UX guild. So this guild essentially says anybody who wants to be an apprentice to user experience can. We will we'll teach you. So if you agree to set to basically have a one-year commitment with us, we will support you for a year. We'll give you training seminars. We'll give you one-on-one -on -one support. Um, we will bring you on field research stuff and you can become a UX apprentice. And that has helped a lot. And so what I learned from this, this how to design with developers in mind, it's that everybody wants ownership of the project and everybody wants to make sure that their opinions and ideas and experiences are heard and are respected. And when they're trying to do this good job, they want to make sure that they have enough information so that they can understand what you want them to do. So it wasn't those detailed design documents. It wasn't me giving them animated uh, gifts of how it's supposed to work. It wasn't just any of those things, the, the communication meetings, the little colored squares. It was a combination of all of it. And I will say to this day, I do not do those detailed design documents anymore. I am very much into the, the mindset of those colored squares and, and notes in the Azure itself. But the combination of all of those things makes communication that much more easy to do. And it makes it just more collaborative as well. So that's what I learned. Now I want you to tell me what you liked and how I can improve. You can put it in the chat. You can search me out on LinkedIn. I'd also like to extend a thank you to our sponsors, Quicken Loans, Object Partners Improving, Farm Credit Services of America, and Qit. Thank you for sponsoring us today. We really appreciate it. And that was my talk. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>